Thank you, Craig. <clears throat> um, so uh, my name is Margaret Hill. I'm the CSC Governance Coordinator at Texas Homeless Network. And I'm going to do a brief welcome presentation. So for anyone who's new, this might be um, helpful for you. Um, so first of all, welcome uh, to, sorry, I'm going to pause my camera because I'm getting some weird stuff happening. Um, so welcome to the April 13th general meeting of the Texas Balance of State Continuum of Care. Um, so uh, uh, this meeting is for general members of the Texas Balance of State Continuum of Care, and um, that's also often abbreviated as TXBUSCOC. So if you see that abbreviation, that's what that means. Um, so general members are anyone that lives or works within the geographical area of the TXBOSCOC. Um, so um, what is the TXBOSCOC? Um, if you don't know, um, it is uh, one of, uh, I believe, 11 COCs in Texas. If you look at this map here, it's the orange counties, so it's pretty large. Um, uh, so the mission statement of the Texas Balance of State Continuum of Care is to develop system level responses and coordinate local community strategies that prevent and end homelessness and increase housing stability. Um, and who, who should attend these meetings? Um, we, of course, welcome anybody and encourage people to attend to learn more about the COC. Um, the information, information presented at these meetings, though, is likely to be most relevant to professionals who are working within homeless services within the TXBUSCOC. Um, and this meeting in particular, um, the topics con c covered will most likely relate to people who are working in the um, kind of program manager, director level of organizations. Um, however, we always encourage anyone who wants to attend and learn more about what the COC is doing um, to do so, and we hope that you continue to attend in the future. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, the Texas Balance of State Continuum of Care, uh, you can check out the Texas Homeless Network website, um, and I would also encourage you to sign up for the uh, TXBOS COC newsletter if you haven't already. Um, it's got lots of really good information about what, what's going on, um, lots of opportunities for people uh, to get involved with the COC and, like, get training. Um, good, really good source of information for people. Um, and there are links in this presentation. Um, you can download this presentation in the materials pod on the screen. Um, I believe also these links are in the resources web link pod at the bottom of the screen as well. Um, also, um, there will be an upcoming orientation um, meeting uh, date to be determined still, um, but that will be announced in the newsletter. So if you're interested in learning more um, in-depth information, make sure you sign up for the newsletter. All right. And I will pass back over to Craig so he can presents more introductory materials for you all. Thank you, Margaret. We're actually going to my favorite part of the presentation. Let's play with the map. Show me where you're from. So to the left side of the map box, you're going to see your controls. You've got an arrow, a pencil, a text tool, a box tool. Select any of those. And let me know where you're joining us from today. Well, let's see, what is that one? Looks like San Angelo right there. OK. Got that. Got some Lubbock, Abilene, nice. <laughs> nice with the heart. Got some Galveston, cool. Anybody in the valley? Has the valley joined us today? There's some. All right. Got a good spread going. We're still missing some of the folks that are registered, so I just want to take some time and let us get, it, get situated. Nice. All right, cool. 
Well, thank you for playing my game. Let's move along, get into the presentation. We'll start this agenda up. And I will hand this over to Mary. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Stalky. I'm the Director of Engagement for the Texas Balance of State COC. And I will be your MC today. Um, we want to start off by welcoming you again. And we're going to focus on our data snapshot first. Um, to talk about system performance measures, or SPMs, is our Director of Data, Lindsay LaGrange. Thanks, Mary. Oh, looks like we've got that going. All right, I'm going to share my screen really quick, or my webcam, rather. All right. Thanks, Mary. Um, so as Mary said, I'm Lindsay LaGrange. I'm the Director of Data at THN, um, and so I will be presenting this uh, meeting's data snapshot. So for this meeting's data snapshot, we're going to look at our recently submitted system performance measures, which I will refer to as SPMs moving forward. SPMs are an annual report for anyone that's not familiar um, that we submit to HUD on behalf of the entire balance of state COC's HMIS data from fiscal year 2021, which started in October of 2020 and ended in September of 2021. So before we look at this year's SPM data that we recently submitted, I wanted to just give a very brief look at SPMs and what each measure uh, looks at specifically. So HUD has developed the following seven system level performance measures to help our communities gauge their process in preventing and ending homelessness. Um, oh, thanks. For, thank you so much for catching all of my acronyms. I appreciate that. Sometimes I forget I'm speaking in acronyms. Um, so these seven measures are what HUD has developed to help us kind of gauge our process in preventing and ending homelessness. So that first measure, measure one, is length of time persons remain homeless. Number two is the extent to which persons who exit permanent housing destinations return to homelessness. So we're looking at folks who are returning into the homelessness system. Uh, number three, number of homeless persons. So that's just looking at our client universe for the entire balance of state. Uh, number four, jobs and income growth for homeless persons in COC program funded projects. And number five, uh, number of persons who become homeless for the first time, so first time homeless. And number six, homelessness prevention and housing placement of persons defined by category three in COC program funded projects. And that one was a mouthful. Uh, the next one, the final one, measure seven is successful housing placement. So the purpose of these materials, or of these measures, I'm sorry, is to provide a more complete picture of how well a community is preventing and ending homelessness. So measure three, the number of homeless persons measure directly assesses a COC's progress towards eliminating um, you know, homelessness by counting the number of people who are experiencing homelessness, both at a point in time and also over the course of one year. Um, and then those six other measures help uh, communities understand how well they're reducing the number of people who become homeless and helping people become quickly and stably housed. The performance measures, as you can tell, are interrelated. So when we analyze them relative to each other, um, we're able to get a more complete picture of uh, you know, how well the system is performing. For example, Measure one, that length of time homeless encourages communities to quickly rehouse people, right? But um, the measures on returns to homelessness, so measure number two, looking at folks returning into the system, and measure number seven, that successful housing placement measure, that's encouraging our communities to ensure that those housing placements are also stable. Um, and so taken together, these measures really allow our communities to more comprehensively evaluate the factors that contribute to ending homelessness. So for COCs to accurately assess their progress using these measures, we have to ensure that our data is as complete and accurate as possible from data entry all the way to reporting on that data. So um, that was my brief look at SPMs. We could spend all day diving into this, but I won't do that. Um, I want to take a quick look at our COC's SPM data um, from this past fiscal year. 
So there's going to be a lot on the screen, but um, we're going to break it down. And before we do that, I just wanted to say, you know, this is just a summary of our SPM data from fiscal year 2021. And it's really important to acknowledge that the date range for this report encompasses a large time frame of the pandemic. And we know that many of our service providers were met with unprecedented challenges due to the pandemic. These types of challenges changed the way that some of our projects operated and it impacted how many people they could let into their facilities and serve and how many people they could provide long-term assistance to. Um, and also very important, but less commonly thought of um, capacity to do data entry correctly and address any data quality issues on the regular basis. Those were all affected by the pandemic. Um, and it's also important to note that for the last reporting period, our COC was met with an unprecedented amount of folks entering into our system because of the migrant crisis at the border. Um, the pandemic, coupled with the migrant crisis this year, has led to some unpredictable outcomes, as you can see, for our system. So let's just quickly walk through, um, you know, kind of what we saw here, uh, just a quick summary. Um, so as you can see, measure 1A, average length of time persons remain homeless. You'll see that column next to it shows us the desired change. So this is obviously the, di the direction that we hope these numbers will go. So obviously we hope that the average length of time um, a person remains homeless will decrease. Um, and you'll see that ours decreased by 65%. That's great, right? But we really need to keep in mind um, that this it has a lot to do with um, the unusual increase in our client universe due to the migrant crisis at the border. So we had an influx of clients and participants into programming like shelter projects for very short periods of time. Um, and so that really saturated our length of time homeless. Um, so you'll see our, our average number decreased from 63 days to 22 days. And that, that was largely due to um, what was happening in the Valley. Um, so measure two, our return to homelessness. Um, so obviously we would like that measure to go down and you'll see that it went down 5%, which is great. Um, so the percent of persons who return to homelessness decreased from 16% to 11%. And then we have measure 4.3, change in total income for adult system stayers during the reporting period. And you'll see that that um, percentage change went down 6%. That's not ideal for us. Um, so the percent of adult stayers who increased their total income, it, that decreased from 38% to 32%. And similarly in that next call, or I'm sorry, in that next row, the change in total income for adult system leavers during the reporting period, that number also went down 15%. Um, so it decreased from 52% to 37%. And um, those last two rows there, we have 5.2, measure 5.2, first time homeless in emergency shelter, transitional housing, and permanent housing projects with no prior HMIS enrollments. So this is um, another one where we can see um, there was a, a large change here. It shot up 198%. Um, so the number of persons who became homeless for the first time increased from 7,256 to 21,626. And again, this is largely due to the pandemic coupled with um, everything that was happening in our, on our border. Um, we had a, a ton of new folks entering our system that had not been there yet. And finally, we have um, 7B.1, successful permanent housing placement from emergency shelter, transitional housing, and rapid rehousing projects. Um, and that went down 5%. So our housing placement rate decreased from 30% to 25%. So again, just to sum that up, um, you know, we definitely have some outcomes here that were not desired, but we need to keep in mind all of those external factors that happened. Um, this has been a, a tough year for, for multiple reasons. All right, well, that is all I have for our data snapshot. So I'm going to pass things back to Mary. Hey, Lindsay, I've got a quick question. Yeah. Did a hotel, for the agencies that were able to use hotel vouchers, did that affect any of these data sets? Um, I'm sure it did. Absolutely. I, I, I don't have that right in front of me, but um, I would imagine that, that that affected it as well. Okay. I was just curious. Good question.
All right. Thanks, Lindsay. And if you all have any questions about the SPMs or um, how your agency might be uh, contributing to those SPMs, certainly feel free to reach out to our HMIS team. That's HMIS at THN.org. Uh, next, we're going to move to uh, our main section, how are we ending homelessness? And today we're going to hear more about the Emergency Housing Voucher Program, or EHV. And I will turn it over to Allie. Hi, everybody. Um, can you all hear me? Awesome. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. You're going to see a little bit behind the curtain for just a second. That's okay. Okay, so let's talk about emergency housing vouchers. So what is an emergency housing voucher? Um, it's a program that is tenant based, um, funded through the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, also known as ARPA. Um, ARPA was signed into law on March 11, 2021 and including, included funding for approximately 70,000 emergency housing vouchers. Um, the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs was allocated 470 to be administered throughout the regions um, of the Texas balance of state. So Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs, they have 470 and THN, Texas Homeless Network, um, is assisting with administering 380 of them across the balance of state. So who are all the major players? So we have Texas Homeless Network um, and on my EHV team is myself as a manager. We have Helen, who is our referral coordinator. Billy, who is our service coordinator, and Corey, who is our accounts payable specialist. We're also working with Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs, TDHCA, and then all of our agencies in our EHV catchment area, which I'm gonna show you what that catchment area looks like a little bit later on. So who is eligible to be referred? Um, in order to meet eligibility for an emergency housing voucher, an individual or family must meet at least one of the four eligible categories literally homeless, at risk, fleeing, attempting to flee, domestic violence, dating, violence, sexual assault, stalking, or human trafficking, or recently homeless, or for whom providing rental assistance will prevent the family's homelessness or having a high risk of housing instability. Um, I will note that eligibility for an emergency housing voucher is limited by statute to 50% area median income. And you can calculate this by going to our website, which I'll provide that link later. Um, we have a link to do that AMI. So what is the EHV process? Um, so Texas Homeless Network has created a referral portal that opens up the second Monday of every month to allow individuals and agencies in covered counties to submit interest in receiving a voucher. Uh, the portal is open for two weeks and an email is sent out on the Friday before opening, notifying agencies and the Thursday before closing date. And our portal is open now. Um, it, was, it will close on the 22nd of this month if you are not on the receiving email, please let us know. Um, I have a specific email I will share with you all at the end that you can send your request to be added to that email chain to. Um, the THN EHV referral coordinator um, will process every referral received to confirm eligibility and send an email notifying the applicant of their status. So this could be a you are eligible email outlining the next steps or an ineligible email that lists additional resources and it allows the referral to appeal if they think the denial is an error. Um, THN will then send prioritized individuals in our emergency housing um, voucher pre-application packet along with a release of information, um, and we need to have this completed and sent back as soon as possible. Um, once that app is received, THN is going to upload it to a secure server um, that TDHCA, Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs, can access to begin processing to create a full application. Um, a little fun fact, when we do that pre-app to TDHCA, TDHCA already goes ahead and pre-fills the uh, full Section 8 out voucher application. Um, Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs will then set up a briefing with the individual or family to discuss the voucher, affordability, where they're wanting to utilize it, and the rules of the program. Um, once the voucher is issued, the agency or individual has 120 days to look for a unit to utilize that voucher. So for the EHV housing search and assistance, like I said, 120 days. 
which sounds like a lot, but it's really hard to find housing in a market like we have today. So THN's EHV service coordinator will be able to provide telephonic housing search and assistance to any individuals who are self-referred to the program and do not have any community support. For individuals and families that are enrolled in programming, the housing search and assistance will fall to the agency and THN will be able to complete um, direct payments when appropriate to properties. Uh, THN currently has an RFP out right now. Um, agencies that must submit THN's request for proposal, which is the RFP, um, to become an approved subrecipient for reimbursements for administering direct housing search and assistance and other eligible EHV program services. Um, if you want to, you will be able to email billy at thn.org, and I can put that in the chat afterwards for more information regarding the RFP process and an option to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion if you want to just dive a little bit deeper before committing. And that is it. Um, you have our website at the very top, our emergency housing vouchers, frequently asked questions, and then the PIH notice along with our email. Now, before I end, I'm actually going to share another screen, which is going to show you what our EHV catchment area looks like. So one second, as you see behind the curtain, once again. Can you all see this page? And if somebody could say yes verbally, since I can't see the chat, that would be helpful. Yeah, we're seeing your map. Awesome. So on our website, thn.org forward slash EHV, if you scroll down, you can see this map. Um, this map is going to be linked on our Google referral portal, which is also on our website if, you want, if you're wanting to apply on behalf or for yourself for an emergency housing voucher. Um, so that you can make sure that you are in an eligible EHV catchment area, meaning your county is covered. Not all counties are covered and you're going to be able to see that. So you can either search your county up here or you can scroll down here. And you can also, this is such a fun map, you can hover over and it's going to tell you. And so if it's this uh, like reddish color, there is full coverage for your county. If you're this orange, it's partial um, coverage, meaning the city of the county is not eligible, but all the surrounding areas are. And if you are blue, that county is not covered and not eligible for an emergency housing voucher through Texas Homeless Network. Um, it's a very, very fun map that uh, Billy on our team created. And that is it for emergency housing vouchers. Thanks, Allie. Um, I wonder if anyone has any questions, because um, we do have a bit of time to uh, entertain questions. And I see um, there are some questions going on in the chat, and Billy is answering them. Uh, one, we know this is an issue with some communities. Not a lot of property management companies in Denton are accepting the voucher. And they're also requiring the tenant to make two to three times the income to use the voucher. So those can definitely be some challenges to this program. Um, Billy has offered to chat with you about ideas. You can reach out to billy at thn.org. Um, Ashley says, yes. a lot of complexes in my area do the two or two and a half times income requirements as well. But we do have some complexes that will accept Section 8 vouchers. Great to hear. Um, Daphne asks, is there housing for Hunt County? Um, I'm not sure about available units but um, in a county. But to go to the questions about utilizing the voucher in this um, unaffordable market that we currently are living in, um, Billy is answering some um, of the questions in the chat. That's because Billy, as our service coordinator, is really working on how to package the eligible services for emergency housing vouchers to entice property owners to rent to uh, applicants. And so we are actively working on that. Um, some of the services that are eligible to properties that you can do is a double deposit, a holding fee, um, you could, you know, talk to them about like, what are the, what are the things that are 
holding you back. And a lot of the times it's the lack of income or the criminal history. And so you can negotiate that with them by, you know, leveraging those service fee costs. And so we're currently working on that as well. Mary. In the chat, uh, landlord myth busting and benefits fact sheet for some ideas about working with landlords to um, engage them in participating in the voucher program. A lot of this speaks to why it was so important that we needed legislation for source of income protection. Because if it's just the fact that these agencies can say, no, we don't want a voucher. So if we had legislation on the books that say, you have to take it, that would open up so many more portals for us. Um, Daphne says they did not receive any vouchers through Endeavors. I think that may have been a different program. Yeah, it's not the EHB program. Um, Cause asks, for counties not included for vouchers, are there other emergency resources? Graham, um, the, this is, it's a misnomer of a name when we say emergency housing voucher. It's another type of Section 8 voucher that was um, through the Biden administration. Um, in response to the pandemic. So anybody who applies for an emergency housing voucher, it's not an immediate response that they're receiving. There's still that whole process that somebody has to work through then to receive uh, that voucher and then to find the housing. So it's, it's a bit of a misnomer for the name. not super familiar, um, but Craig did put a link in the chat, uh, LHCs in place to help navigate local programs and resources. All right, and Ashley says, um, many of my consumers are on SSI or SSDI and landlords sometimes are resistant due to their fixed income status. And Billy responds, Ashley, um, education is definitely key when it comes to property owners in the voucher program. So know that we have Billy on our team. Um, actually, the emergency housing voucher team is entirely new to us at THN. Um, we created a team when the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs had money available for vouchers within our COC and asked us to partner with them in trying to make sure that we're getting those vouchers to people who can use them. So Ali is new and uh, as is her team. And I think we'll, uh, Kara will introduce the whole team at the end of our meeting. All right, anything else for EHV? Thank you, Ali, and we'll go ahead and move on to our next agenda item, which is our community conversation. This is a time of the meeting where we talk about a topic and then we definitely want to get your input on the topic. And today we'll be talking about our barriers fund. So I will turn it over to Anya. Mary, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anya Taylor. And I serve as the Barriers Fund Coordinator for Texas Homeless Network. Uh, for this month's community conversation, I, along with Sarah Eckel, who serves as the Housing and Development Coordinator for Concho Valley Community Action Agency, will be presenting on the Texas Balance of State Continuum of Care Barriers Fund Program. And before I turn it over to Sarah to share how Concho Valley Community Action Agency has worked to administer the program in their community, 
I wanted to first start out with an introduction to the Barriers Fund program, as well as providing everyone with some key program highlights of what Texas Homeless Network, of course, in partnership with our CSBG CARE subrecipients, have been able to accomplish through the administration of the Barriers Fund. As I know through our pre-meeting survey that was sent out before today's call, approximately 60% um, or even higher of those in attendance today have not heard about the Barriers Fund program previously. So we are happy to provide um, a report and update on this program for you today. Um, so let's dive right into it. Um, so an introduction into the Barriers Fund program. So through the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs, THN was actually chosen as a recipient to receive and oversee approximately $962,000 in Community Service Block Grant or CSBG um, CARES Act funding. Um, I'm, oh, I was just noticing in the chat that um, someone is having audio issues, so I'm hoping everyone can hear clearly. I will keep moving unless someone, um, one of the staff wants to pause. Um, no, you're good. I'm hearing you. Okay. Thanks, Craig. Um, so out of the total $962,000 in CSBG CARES Act funding that THN or Texas Homeless Network was awarded, um, $489,970 was actually used to establish a barriers fund program for the purpose of providing services to eligible low-income households across the balance of state that are either currently experiencing homelessness or are at risk of becoming homeless, um, specifically those who have been impacted by COVID-19. So moving on to some of the essential um, elements of the project or program. I mean, you can see there that the Barriers Fund was really designed um, to be used as a fund of last resort and accessed when no other funding or resources are available in the community to meet that particular need. Um, in addition to be using as a fund of last resort, um, the Community Service Block Grant or CSBG CARES Act funds that actually support the project um, are to be used solely for the purpose of preventing, preparing for, or responding to COVID-19, as these are not regular Community Service Block Grant or CSBG funds. They are funneled through the CARES Act. So that is another program requirement. Um, also, uh, a fun fact about the Barriers Fund Program and Community Service Block Grant funds is that unlike some of the other housing programs like Emergency Housing Voucher or federal funded pro housing programs like Rapid Rehousing, CSBG funds are very flexible in the types of assistance um, that can be provided. And you can see that um, on the third bullet point there that through the Barriers Fund program, we can actually provide assistance with basic needs and emergency services such as rental assistance, mortgage assistance, utilities, medical costs, rent, transportation, food, and child and or senior care. Um, clients or households do have to be income eligible to receive assistance through the Barriers Fund program. Um, and so as a program requirement, clients must not exceed more than 200% of the federal poverty level or FPL um, and or 50% of the area median income. So as you may know, Texas Homeless Network is actually not a direct service provider. And so when THN was chosen as a recipient to receive and oversee this um, these funds, uh, it was important for us to come up with a way to make sure that uh, low income individuals and families across the balance of state received assistance. Um, and so with that, we actually um, established a application for funding uh, that was released in January of 2021 
where eligible nonprofit agencies or social service agencies who are already doing this type of work in their communities could apply for funding through the Barriers Fund program. Through that process, we were able to award 11 different nonprofit agencies with CSVG program funds to establish and administer a local barriers fund program project in their designated service area. Uh, you can see them listed there and I want to acknowledge these agencies um, for all of the work that they've done in their communities over this past year as they work to administer the fund and provide emergency services to eligible low income households. Um, so our community partners consist of Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley, uh, Concho Valley Community Action Agency, who is here to co-present with me today, Denton County MHMR Center, Family Violence Shelter of Kalmau County, or Crisis Center of Kalmau County, Good Neighbor Settlement House, Hilltop Recovery Ministries, NB Housing Partners, Society of St. Vincent de Paul, the Salvation Army of New Braunfels, United Way of Brazoria County, and the United Way of Denton County. Uh, we also wanted to include for everyone today uh, the service area by county. And so you can see we have a pretty um, broad service area through the Barriers Fund program with approximately 26 counties who receive um, funding uh, through the Barriers Fund. So those 26 counties is where our 11 subrecipients are providing the direct services. So here are some of the highlights and key program updates. Um, and before I get into this, I just wanted to clarify that our application for funding was released in January of 2021. And I mentioned through that process, we were able to award 11 different nonprofit agencies with CSBG program funds to implement and administer a local barriers fund program project in their designated service area. Um, we, we being THN or Texas Homeless Network actually executed service agreements with all 11 agencies who received um, funds through the Barriers Fund program in March of 2021. Um, those service agreements run through, um, they were executed in March of 2021, and they are actually set to end in May of this year. Um, so we are quickly approaching the end of the contract term. Um, as far as some of the key program updates, we did want to share that approximately 82% of all barriers fund program funds have been expended as of February 28, 2022. Um, and you can see there that 82% or $414,251 out of the entire grant amount awarded to CSBG care subrecipients have been expended as of the end of February. And you can see in parentheses there that um, we have indicated that $501,970 was allocated to our CSBG care subrecipient agencies. And that's actually different than the amount listed on our um, introduction to the program. And that's because we were actually able to award an additional $12,000 um, from our contract with TDHCA um, for the Barriers Fund program for the purpose of providing assistance to eligible low-income households and families. Um, in addition to funds expended at this point, um, in partnership with our CSBG CARE subrecipient agencies, we have been able to serve 347 unduplicated low-income households um, as of February 28th of 2022. Um, this number actually surpasses our initial commitment to serve 225 unduplicated low-income households by the end of the contract term, which is really great. So we have exceeded our initial performance expectations. And then lastly, 30% of all technical assistance hours provided agency-wide in the last six months come from the Barriers Fund program. Um, so you can see there that in the last six months alone, approximately 517 hours of um, TA has been provided agency-wide. 
and the barriers fund accounts for 30 percent um, of those hours. And so technical assistance is a big part of the barriers fund program and um, THN continues to provide ongoing support and technical assistance to all of our community partners who are administering the fund at the local level. Um, very quickly here, um, as I mentioned, 347 low income households have been assisted as of February of 2022. Um, that brings the average cost per household to a little over $1,000. And so you can see that's the average cost um, or the average um, amount, a uh, dollar amount of assistance being provided to each household through the Barriers Fund. Uh, this is a, a breakdown of our expenditure rates by quarter. Um, now, when we talk about expenditure rates, I'm only capturing the expenditures under the Barriers Fund program. Um, so not our entire CSBG care service contract that we have in place with TDHCA. Um, as I, I mentioned earlier, contracts were executed in March of 2021 with our CSBG CARE subrecipients, and they run through May of 2022. Um, in March of 2021, we actually had no activity under the Barriers Fund program as the contracts had just recently been executed and our agencies needed time to really implement the program or project in their service area. Um, so in quarter one of the contract term, we saw approximately $51,000 in expenditures. And you can see that that number has increased um, significantly over the last two quarters. Um, this is the same kind of expenditure rates, but broken out um, instead of by quarter. This is a line graph showing you um, by month kind of what we are receiving from our subrecipients. The Barriers Fund actually operates as a reimbursement program, grant program. So what that means is our subrecipient agencies submit a reimbursement report to THN um, every single month for expenditures or costs incurred in the previous month. Um, and THN reviews those reports and processes reimbursement to our community partners. And so you can see there that um, throughout the contract term, we have continued to see an increase in expenditure rates among our subrecipients. Um, this is a really cool chart. This is a cost breakdown by expenditure. Um, so out of the total amount that was allocated to our CSBG CARE subrecipient agencies, an agency could request funding for three different budget line items. Of course, direct client assistance being the first um, and primary budget line item. Uh, direct client assistance is the assistance being provided um, to eligible low-income families or households. Um, agencies could also request funding if it is written into their contract for program and admin costs to support the administration of the fund at the um, agency level. Um, so according to the cost breakdown, approximately 88, 89% of funds have gone to direct client assistance, which is really great. That means that we are getting the funds out into the community and into um, in providing assistance to those who are um, in need. 7% uh, come from program costs and another 5% in administrative costs. And with that, that really concludes my overview and introduction into the Barriers Fund program. So I'm very excited and happy to turn our presentation over to Sarah Eckel to talk a little bit more about what Concho Valley Community Action Agency has been able to do um, with this program. Hi, thanks, Anya. Um, my name is Sarah Eckel. I am the Housing and Development Director for Concho Valley Community Action Agency. And I surely appreciate THN uh, letting me talk about how we were able to help our community with these funds. Um, we really, as Anya pointed out, um, the, we use the Barriers Fund. Uh, the Barriers Fund were used as a fund of last resort. Um, so we use this as a way to work with our community partners uh, 
to help get client households into stable housing or keep their housing stable. Um, and we did that through outreach. Uh, we worked to talk to our community partners, tell them about the funds that were available, um, providing examples of how we could help them just based on previous conversations and areas uh, where we needed to be able, um, where, where there weren't uh, funds available and where there were gaps in services. Um, and then a huge part of it was our intake process where we worked with clients and we talked about their, um, their needs and then identifying the resources that were available to them. Uh, for outreach and partnerships, we used um, education. Um, again, just going to our community partners and talking to them about the barriers funds and, and how we'd be able to use them. As Anya mentioned, it's very creative. Um, we partnered a lot with our housing authority to help them get um, clients who had just recently gotten the housing choice voucher into a unit. Um, so being able to do like the, the security deposit or a utility deposit to make that housing accessible to them. Um, and then, you know, we, we were also administering a couple other programs at the time. So clients that fell outside of the boxes for those programs, we were able to help them. And then, um, we did a lot through our referral platform. And so we did that, it, we use a referral platform called Unite Us. And that referral platform allows us to do warm handoffs with other agencies. So an agency could refer over to us for services and we could assess that those services and recognize that they would be a good fit for barriers funds. And so we would have the clients come in, do the application process and start talking to them. And then of course we did some, we did case management with all of our clients, um, making sure that when we made those payments that we were doing something that was going to help them make a, at least work towards having stable housing. Of course we can never guarantee it, but that's always our goal. Um, as I said, our client assessment consisted really on a three part assessment after we got the application from them, I mean, made sure that it was a, a cost that was eligible, that they were income qualified. Um, we sat down and talked to the client about why they needed this help. Um, what, was there anything else that we could make available to them? Is there another resource of the community that could better serve them? And then again, like I said, how will this make a difference? Uh, we, we kept them to usually one-time payments. I think we had one exception to that rule, um, but for the most part, it was a one-time payment um, where we we wanted to to do something to overcome a barrier, to overcome an obstacle, to to get them access. Um, so, like if we if they're in a if they're if we're making a utility deposit and they're getting into a housing unit, are they on a housing choice voucher? Are do they have the income to support that housing unit? Can we work with them to fill out the application so that they're getting um, utility assistance through LIHEAP? So whatever we can do to make sure that we're not just making a payment and it's just, you know, throwing water on a forest fire, you know, a bucket of water on a forest fire. Are we, are we doing something? Are we really working with, with this client household and we're making a difference? Um, and then, of course, one of our biggest things was just, again, telling that story through our documentation of how that, how that payment was income eligible. Uh, as I mentioned before, we want to set up our, our clients for success. Um, a lot of times clients would come back um, for subsequent meetings with the case manager. And again, if we were filling out utility assistance, if we were working with them to um, get on SNAP or, or things like that. If we were filling out their housing choice voucher applications, just whatever it was where we had identified through the course of that conversation, if they needed a workforce solutions referral or, you know, 
we could send them over to Goodwill to, to do um, workforce help. So we would have them come in for a couple times afterwards just to follow up and make sure that we were working with them and that we were helping them be successful in maintaining their housing stability. Um, through, through the course of this, um, through the course of having um, the Barriers Fund program in our community, we've really recognized as a community how important this has been to us and how it's helped us to be able um, to help client households access other funds, um, whether it be a housing choice voucher or utility assistance through CAP or something like that, that this was a, this was a piece of making um, of, of making our community more stably housed. So we've been working um, with other community partners to be able to have funds available so that we can we can keep this here so that we can continue to make to to be able to have uh, resources for the community where we can bridge gaps, um, where we can connect those dots, and we can work outside of program guidelines when we know that 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 one payment or that one thing is going to make the difference um, in getting a client access to stable housing. Uh, and we have been able, we were able to do that um, through some foundation support and some private donor support, but also really just talking about how the Barriers Fund has been a success in our community, um, has made people want to keep these funds in our communities. So here's my contact information. I'm happy to talk to anybody if you have questions about how we ran the program or if you want to just see um, examples of, of how we did client assessments and intakes or anything like that. Um, always happy to be a resource and to share with our community. So thanks, Anya. Presentation um, as part of this meeting's community conversation, we wanted to take an opportunity to really open it up to meeting attendees or participants um, to see if you had any questions about the Barriers Fund program that we can help answer, or if Sarah can provide additional insight into what community um, Concho Valley Community Action Agency has done as far as the sustainability of the program. Um, as we want this to be applicable and really express the importance, like Sarah mentioned, of the Barriers Fund program or this type of program in the community. So we're happy to answer any questions you may have um, at this time. I see a couple of people um, typing, so I will pause here. But um, if there are no questions um, at this time, that's completely fine. Um, I will drop my contact information into the chat. Um, so that way you can reach out if, in fact, a question does pop up. Thanks, Craig. Um, I'm happy to answer those. Um, oh, what are the majority of direct... Um, Molly um, asks, what are the majority of direct client assistance payments made? Um, so Molly, thank you for that question. That, that is a, a really good question. Um, I would say for the Barriers Fund program, the majority of payments made um, does tend to be rental and or mortgage assistance payments. Um, however, uh, with this program, like I said, we do have our subrecipients who tailor their program according to the community needs or the, the clients that they are assisting. So for example, we have one subrecipient who allocated a percentage of their total grant award only for food assistance. Um, so they actively seek out clients um, in their community who are in need of uh, food. Um, and that's how they uh, expend their funds. So it really depends because our subrecipients are 
uh, located throughout the balance of state, what the community need is. Uh, we will say for the Barriers Fund program, uh, it does operate a bit differently from other housing programs, as I mentioned. Um, and so the re rental um, assistance that is provided, um, I have seen could be like, for example, what Sarah mentioned, if an agency is working to connect a client with a program such as the Emergency Housing Voucher Program or a Rapid Rehousing Program, and that client is waiting to be housed, the Barriers Fund Program is a good resource to provide that housing in the interim on a short-term basis for that client while they wait more um, um, stable housing. I also see another question about the Barriers Fund. Um, from Delisha. So Barriers Fund has been beneficial to rapid rehousing program participants. Oh, at the United Way of Denton County. Um, so that's really great to hear. Thank you for that. And then Molly says, that's awesome. There's flexibility, helping people with what they actually need and want. That's exactly right. And so we encourage our subrecipients to really provide wraparound case management services to really work with the client to identify what the need is. Because the Barriers Fund is a really good program to um, combine with another housing program. So for example, if um, the client is being housed through a rapid rehousing program or emergency housing voucher program, um, but is still in need of, let's say, transportation to go to work, that's when the Barriers Fund can be a useful program um, to provide that assistance that is needed. Uh, so Delisha says, will the Barriers Fund program continue? Um, that's a really great question. Um, we are, um, like Sarah mentioned, our communities do have a plan to sustain the program once the initial grant award has been exhausted. Uh, so as I mentioned um, earlier, our contracts with our subrecipients are set to end in May of 2022. Um, and THN's contract with um, the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs is set to end in June of this year. Um, so we will actually not be receiving an additional award to continue or to sustain the Texas Balance of State Continuum Care Barriers Fund Program. However, um, like Sarah had mentioned in her presentation, our agencies um, who do receive Barriers Fund have recognized the importance of this type of program and therefore have worked with other community agencies um, to find creative ways to sustain this, this program um, after, after May. Those are really great questions, so I appreciate that. Okay. Well, I don't see any more questions coming through, so I will go ahead and turn it back over to Mary um, for the next part of today's meeting. Thank you, Anya and Sarah. Um, we wanted to make sure to share an update on the Barriers Fund with you because some of you have heard about it from the beginning of our contract time. And we were hoping that we'd have be able to help a number of people across the COC um, with that little bit of funding that was very flexible, that could make a big difference in their lives. And it sounds like we certainly did. Um, you'll see next on our agenda is a time for COC general members to address the COC. And so we want to make sure that we're giving you an opportunity to talk with us about any topic that you'd like. So we are <clears throat> throwing the gates wide open. If you have a question for us, a comment for us, um, it's an important part of our meeting that we want to make sure we're giving it general members an opportunity to talk about something that isn't necessarily on the agenda, but that is important to you. So um, if you would just type anything into the chat. Also know that you're welcome to reach out to any of us on staff at any time. Um, all of our email addresses are our first name at thn.org. If you work with any of us already, you're welcome to reach out to that person, even if that person uh, may not be in charge of the topic you're asking about, they'll definitely get you connected. And also we will, our staff will stay on this meeting for about 15 minutes after the meeting officially ends 
and you'll have time to stay on with us if you'd like to talk with us individually. Okay, I'm not seeing anything, but uh, know that again, you can reach out to us at any time with questions and suggestions and ideas. All right, well then I will move on to the next topic and we are now going to get an update of our COC board from our COC board chair, Daphne Adams. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Alrighty, well, I will get started. My name is Daphne Adams, as Mary stated, and I am the, the chair of the Texas COC board. So I'm just going to give you a few updates from starting in December, since we haven't met in a little while. In December, the board approved revisions to the COC governance charter to provide clarification in the language used to allow COC general members to suggest amendments to update the COC policy against criminalization to prevent the homelessness from being criminalized and to clarify the role of THN and the NOFO of the COC program funding. In January, the board approved changes to the COC committee's policy. The changes describe the committee member nomination and election process and the board also approved changes to the COC board requirements policy that describe the nomination and election process for the board. In February, the board approved a request from the Ending Youth Homelessness Committee to establish a youth action board that would be the subcommittee of the Ending Youth Homelessness Committee. As part of this request, it also amended the COC board requirements policy to allow for an additional seat to the board for that youth action board member. The board also approved a board action request from the committee investment committee to transfer a COC program funding contract between two service providers that are merging. In March, the board approved the release of the youth homelessness demonstration program RFP but the NOFO came out earlier than anticipated and the, the board decided not to apply this round. So as you can see, we've been quite busy and thank you, Craig, for my acronyms and that's all I have for today. Thank you, Daphne. We really appreciate you being here with us. Um, I want to point out at the end of your agenda, we do have a written announcement that I'm now ad-libbing and making a verbal announcement. Um, we had two board members resign, one in December and one in February. They both moved out of Texas, and so therefore they're not in our coverage area anymore and couldn't commit to um, staying a board member. And so we elected two new people. Uh, Nora Vargas with the city of Corpus Christi is now filling seat 10 and representing Emergency Solutions Grant recipient. And D. Ross is now in seat 11, representing public housing authorities. And D. is with the uh, Victoria Housing Authority in Victoria, Texas. So we welcome those two new board members to the board. All right, in addition to new board members, we have a lot of new staff members at THN. Um, Craig mentioned that there are a number of us on the call today. And so we wanted to give an opportunity to Kira and Lindsay to introduce some team members. So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Mary. Um, yes, so we've had some recent changes at THN um, to uh, some of our positions. Um, specifically, I'll be talking about the changes we've had on the data team. Um, or also the HMIS team, as, as some of y'all know us by. Um, so I'll just walk through those changes, uh, the first one being my position. Um, so if the data team would go ahead and, and turn on their webcams and I'll, I'll introduce everyone, um, that would be great. So um, I'll get started. I'm Lindsay LaGrange, and I am the new director of data at THN. Our previous director of data, Kristen Zakor, is now THN's chief operating officer. 
Um, so next I will introduce uh, Marissa Ortega, THN's data and policy analyst. Um, Marissa is not new to THN either, but she's new to, to her position and we're really excited um, about, about that. Um, and after Marissa, we have Paula Dewey. So Paula is also new to her role, but not to THN or the data team. Um, she was wor working previously on um, specifically with ESG and ESG CV funding and data, and she's now shifting into a new role, which is the database coordinator. Um, and next we have Gabrielle Garcia, THN's new training coordinator. Uh, Gabrielle is new to THN and to the team. Um, her role is focused on HMIS training and um, running HMIS webinars. And last but not least, we have Cosme Dominguez. He is also new to THN and his position is the HMIS data analyst. So um, as you can see, we've had a lot of changes on our team uh, since we last met, um, and we're really excited for both of our new team members and also everyone in, in new positions. Um, so if you have any further questions about the data team and um, what our positions are and, and what those encompass, please check out our website for more information. And um, I'm now going to pass things over to Kira to talk about um, some other introductions that we have. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so kind of building off of changes from the data team, y'all might remember me as uh, the previous data coordinator of Texas Homeless Network, and I have now taken on the position of the director of systems change. Um, before I introduce the two teams that I'm planning on introducing, I just want to highlight some differences that might change the way that we interact with y'all a little bit. Um, historically, systems change work, especially coordinated entry, has been housed under the uh, planning team. However, um, with the introduction of the director position, it has also uh, created an opportunity for us to completely separate those two teams. So I'm going to go ahead and get started by introducing the planning team first. So if the planning team would like to um, share your webcams. I can talk through some of these introductions. Um, I will note that um, you did already hear about some of the new employees via the presentation earlier and also um, most of the members of the planning, new members of the planning team have been here since December, so you likely have already been on calls or emails with them. Um, but just to kind of go through and highlight those uh, changes, so Axton Nichols is our um, emergency solutions coordinator. Hope Rogers is our COC performance coordinator. Um, and then when we're looking at the EHV team, so Allie Edmondson is the EHV manager. Um, so she is the supervisor of Helen Garcia, our EHV referral coordinator. And then Billy, our EHV service coordinator. So. Um, like we kind of said, so we we kind of took out the systems change and coordinated entry piece, but then, you know, we didn't want to leave that gap. So then there's the EHV folks. So this is all under the director of planning, um, which is currently a vacant position right now. Um, so thanks y'all for uh, working through that with me. Now I'm going to switch gears and see if the systems change team can go ahead and share their cameras. Um, so again, systems change team, um, our primary focus and work with y'all will be related to coordinated entry um, and some of those larger scope um, opportunities with systems change work in general. Like I said, I am the director of systems change, so I am the supervisor for this team. Um, Katie is not new to THN. She actually was promoted to the system change coordinator, um, but many of you have known her for the last, uh, I want to say almost three years at this point. So. Um, could just be guessing. Um, <laughs> so Katie is um, our only kind of s sustained member from the systems change team. The rest of our folks are all brand new within the last couple months. Um, so one quick change, the data coordinator position has been moved over to the <coughs> systems change team. Um, so our new data coordinator is Alex. Um, she has taken over my previous position um, and we moved it over to the systems change team to kind of talk about long-term planning, about how we are going to be moving the point in time count into a more uh, long-term project instead of only one day. Um, and then we have our two new positions that we haven't had. Um, so our systems change analyst, uh, Ruby Sanchez. Um, so she is 
we're still kind of figuring out exactly what the roles are going to look like. Um, and then Crystal is our systems change specialist. So I know this is a ton of names, and I also want to recognize that a lot of these titles sound very similar. We are not expecting y'all to know exactly who to email. The main purpose of this process was one, to let you know that you're going to be seeing lots of new emails, uh, names in your uh, inboxes over the next couple months, and then um, to give you opportunities for reaching out as you are trying to navigate our system. But just know that if you ever contact one of us and it is the incorrect person, we will always refer you to the person whose specialist area that is. But this is the new systems change team. Um, so thanks y'all for hopping on. Um, if you have any questions or you want to know more about people's positions, you want to email them, you want to look at their pretty faces on the uh, website, you can go to thn.org and there is a section of our website that has all of our staff on there. We're still in the process of updating it, so if you do have questions that you can't find via uh, that source, you can always email one of the directors or one of the other colleagues you work with at THN. And so with that, I believe I am passing it back to Mary. Thank you, Kira and Lindsay, and welcome again to all of our new team members and congratulations to uh, a number of people who have been promoted. Um, you'll see that we're growing and changing every day in response to changing environment, new pools of funding that have become available, new ways of doing our work that we hope that uh, will support you and your communities um, more effectively. Um, so uh, we're glad you're here. Now you've seen some of our faces and um, just please reach out if you need anything at all. Um, one other announcement that is also a written announcement, but I'm going to announce it because we have a little bit of extra time. Um, the next local homeless coalition or LHC conference call uh, will be held on Thursday, April 26th at 10 o'clock. And you'll see this uh, on the back page of your agenda. The topic is rep repotting relationships. I like repotting a plant, Jen told me. Uh, a discussion on building trust against a backdrop of historical tension. We know that within LHCs trying, to, or really any group, trying to get a whole group on the same page, um, setting priorities and making plans to meet needs um, can be challenging. And so this topic is going to be a lot of peer discussion about what has worked in your community to repot relationships and help people all and work together. Our next meeting of the general membership is on June 8th in, in two months. And we have now have these meetings every two months. Uh, and so watch our website and the BOS newsletter for more information. Um, also, as I said earlier, staff will be available for about 15 minutes after the call if you'd like to stick around after the meeting ends and talk with us about anything. Uh, we invite you to give your feedback in the anonymous survey that you'll receive after this meeting from our webinar software. Um, we ask questions about what you found helpful, what you didn't find so helpful, what you would recommend for next time, other topics you would like us to talk about, that sort of thing. And then uh, ways that you can become a COC member, which really just means that you're participating in our work because the fact that you live and or work in our area means you are a general member of the COC. So there's no membership dues, there's no paperwork to fill out, you just consider yourself a member. Um, finally, I wanna say on the second page of the agenda, you'll see our committee updates. We do have a number of committees within the COC who work on specific topics. Um, those committees do have different times that they recruit new members, but if you are interested at all in serving on a committee, you're welcome to check out our webpage uh, that has committee information, and there are there's information about how you can reach out about joining a committee. All right, uh, and thank you, Lindsay. I see she put a link in the chat to our staff page, and as Kira said, we're still updating that page, so not everyone that you met today uh, has their information on that page yet, but we're working on it. And I believe that is it for the end of our official agenda for today. Uh, 
Uh, we appreciate you taking some time to spend with us and hope that you found this information valuable. And again, we will stay on the meeting for a short while if you'd like to talk to us more. And otherwise, we will see you as we do our work over the next few months, if not at the next general membership meeting on June 8th. Thank you, everyone. Ooh, that was a lot of material today. <laughs> I think that the Talk system about. would short. <laughs> I also think that the system would short itself if we tried to all share our webcams from how many staff we have now. <laughs> I don't know. We'll try it and see. <laughs> we can do it at the end, not at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, I see a, a lot of people who joined us today that uh, work. It's always good to see some new names, too. Yes, definitely. Just as we are growing and changing, we you know. <laughs> That's okay, Ashley. If you, if you got any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. about an EHV email list. Yeah, they have their own email. That's the one I, I sent that one to you last week, Ashley. Ashley's actually a transition advocate for Mounting Horizons. That's in our jurisdiction that we just connected last week. What can they serve Brazoria, Galveston, Harris, and I think a little bit of Montgomery County, if that's right, Ashley. I tried to capture as many notes as I could. Yeah. Great. Well, welcome. Brazoria, that's it. Gonna change. Let's see. Hold on. <laughs> same. Same. And get you 10 minutes back to your day. <laughs> well, it 
doesn't look like anything else is coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and call it at 320. All right. And End team, we are scheduled to have, um, thanks, Alyssa, or I don't know if that's how you pronounce your name, but thank you for coming. Um, THN team, we are scheduled to do a plus delta at 345. Um, do you all want to do that at 345 or do you want to start that a little earlier? Y'all can start. I, Kirk called me. I've got something I need to do first and then I can jump in. But yeah, let's go ahead and end this one. Everybody, y'all have a great afternoon. Thank y'all for joining us and we will see you. I should know this. June 8th. Mm -hmm. June 8th. We'll see you on June 8th. Bye. <laughs> Bye.